Good morning. My name is Londe Ajose, and I'm the Vice President and Walter and Esther Hewlett Chair of Understanding California's Future and Senior Fellow with PPIC. Thank you for joining us today. PPIC is pleased to present this program featuring California State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurmond. Before we jump into our program, I have a few housekeeping items. This event is a part of PPIC speaker series on California's future. As a public charity, PPIC does not take or support positions on any ballot measure or legislation, nor does it support, endorse, or oppose any political parties or candidates for public office. We'd like to thank the sponsors of this series for their underwriting support. These organizations are listed on your screen and on our website. The series is also funded by the PPIC Donor Circle and the PPIC Corporate Circle, groups of individuals and organizations that provide generous support to PPIC. Please consider joining us as a sponsor or donor so that we may continue to make programs like today's possible and ensure that they're free to attend. More information is available at ppic.org. And finally, before we begin, if you have a question for the superintendent, please send an email to the email address seen on the screen, ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. We would appreciate you including your name and organization along with your question, and we'll make sure to save 15 minutes at the end of our program so that we can devote time to your questions. I would now like to welcome our featured speaker, California State Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurmond. Good morning, greetings. Thank you, Lande. Mr. Superintendent, thank you for joining us today. Dr. Jose, it's a pleasure to be with you and all the folks at PPIC. Thank you. And we just wanted to say what gratitude we have for your public service at this really critical time, both for our state and our nation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to start with a, a big picture question, and that is looking ahead and thinking about California kind of poised to turn the corner on the pandemic. What do you think is the most challenging issue facing our K-12 system? I mean, you could almost list 10 things as the top issue and they're all important, right? We've got to do better around uh, recruitment and retention of, of school staff, both teachers, um, you know, classified staff and bus drivers. Um, we know that our students have uh, struggled during the pandemic and that we've got to support uh, their learning recovery. But I would say out of all the top issues, I would say that we must be focused on how our students uh, heal from the trauma of the pandemic. Um, mm -hmm. The world has experienced trauma uh, and we know that our students can recover academically and socially. But we've got to make sure that we can combat the high levels of depression uh, that we've seen in young people during the pandemic. And uh, we're working on a number of strategies to, to make that our number one focus, addressing the social emotional learning needs uh, of our students. Well, thank you for that. And I do have some questions about how we think about the socio emotional needs, how we think about the mental health challenges of our students. But I actually want to start with something a little personal, because in addition to being our state superintendent of public instruction, people often forget that you are the parent of school-aged children. And I'm wondering how your girls have fared during the pandemic and what's been most difficult for you as a parent? You know, I, I imagine my experience is like almost all parents. It's been difficult every uh, turn of the way uh, when schools were closed, you know, uh, difficulties for children to connect when um, we were in remote learning. But probably the biggest challenge was the disconnection um, you know, we're not meant to be disconnected. Mm -hmm. And for us as adults, we can, we can manage it. It's not ideal, but we can manage it. But for young people, it's difficult when you are forming your personality and you're adjusting and you're adapting and you're growing. And, you know, as the father of two teenage girls who've attended California public schools, you know, they've, they've seen their share of difficult moments. Um, but uh, they continue to be resilient, like all of our students our educators, uh, our families. And I have to give a big shout out to parents and families for the things that parents have done during this time. Um, many literally staying home to take care of kids. Some have lost jobs in order to care for their family. And of course, we've all, you know, either lost a loved one or seen some other disruption. So I, I just give uh, high praise to our parents uh, who've been able to uh, shoulder the struggle, um, continue to take care of kids, and, uh, and, you know, it's one of the reasons why 
uh, I'm sponsoring a bill that would help us to recruit and train 10,000 new mental health clinicians. I really, you know, think that uh, we've got to make this our top priority. And having seen it as a father and seeing it in, in my role, I, I know that everyone has struggled, but I believe that we can bounce back with the right resources and supports. You mentioned the, the mental health bill that you're, you're sponsoring, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what some of the most important steps are that you think that the state should take to promote kind of the mental and emotional well-being of students and their families. So happy to. Uh, the bill is called SB 1229, uh, authored by Senator McGuire, who's been a great partner um, in talking about how to create health access in places where it doesn't exist. Uh, the bill essentially provides a scholarship of sorts um, to anyone who is aspiring to become a mental health clinician, a master's level person who will become either a master's in social work or a master's in family therapy, many disciplines um, related to counseling, um, and that they can receive a $25,000 grant to help mm -hmm. them become a clinician. This is so important because even before the pandemic, um, by many accounts, California was only able to provide about 30% of the need uh, when it relates to having a, a professional trained in behavioral health. And so as we move to come out of the pandemic, we know that the effects of the pandemic will linger for many, many years. And that means that we've got to build a workforce of individuals who can support uh, our students and families. And the way this bill works, it provides the scholarship and it says that it prioritizes those who are willing to commit to at least two years working in schools and working in high need areas. Uh, if you think about the 20 or so counties in the state that experienced fires this year, uh, the need for trauma-informed supports was mm -hmm. great, even, even beyond the pandemic. And so um, we've made this our top priority bill, uh, leaning in all the way to make sure that we are able to build out a workforce of 10,000 more uh, clinicians who can support California students and their families. That's, that's really important. You know. As I reflect on the pandemic, I realized that last fall was just such a critical point for California schools, with so many of our schools returning in person in some form. And I'm wondering, as you reflect on the past year, what letter grade would you give the state on reopening schools? And, and how would you think about some of the key lessons? You know, I started visiting schools in last July when they were beginning to open. And, uh, you know, this was just as vaccines were becoming available. And so our schools were still figuring it out. I give our schools high marks, really, for, for getting open and figuring out how to make COVID testing available, having students return wearing masks, trying to scramble to put supports in place, all that and trying to make sense of really what was a tough form of independent study that the state uh, only allowed by law in order to say for students who could not come to school that they could have independent study. It was, it was difficult to figure out how to implement it, but what was harder is that um, shortly after our schools opened, we saw spikes in, in, in the COVID variants that meant that there weren't teachers and staff available uh, to support our students, that students were coming to school um, you know, with COVID. Uh, and so there were many, many challenges that had to be navigated and our schools have continued to show resilience and innovation and finding ways to work through every challenge that comes their way. You know, the, the state has done its part by providing billions of dollars for computers, for COVID resources, holding vaccine outreach events, um, trying to provide resources for after school and expanded learning programs, tremendous resources being provided. But at the end of the day, our school districts, every each of the 1,000 of them has had to figure out how to make it work in their community. And I give our schools high marks for what they've done to, to show that California schools can be open. By and large, California schools stayed open more than most other states. And, and I give our schools high marks for making that happen. What, what would you say were some of the more innovative or, or some of the key um, actions that schools had to take to reopen and reopen well? I'm wondering, you know, what, what some of the schools did to, to earn those high marks and to demonstrate to their communities that they were resilient, that they were ready, that they were ready to embrace students, especially given, you know, the different degrees of learning loss that some students experienced over the course of the pandemic. What were some of those strategies? Well, I, I'd point to a range of things. We worked with the governor's office to, to get more than 3 million rapid COVID tests uh, to our schools. As schools reopened in the fall, that was critical because that meant now 
that you could have results about whether or not someone was positive within 15 minutes. That kind of awareness meant that if someone was positive, they could stay home in quarantine while you kept the rest of the school community safe. Our schools also use those rapid COVID tests to help relaunch sports um, on campus and to keep athletes safe when they were coming into contact during sporting contests uh, in events. Uh, our schools started working to expand our after school programs and meals uh, for our schools. You know, uh, during one point in the, in the, the uh, pandemic, we noted that our schools had provided more than 900 million meals uh, to hungry students. And so schools, once again, have become the center uh, of, of many things. Uh, of course, uh, academic needs for, to support our students. Um, and, uh, but, but at the same time for providing services and supports, and I'm happy to talk with you about our community school strategy. It's a $3 billion strategy of uh, providing health, mental health, uh, social services, and, and other transformative services that can help to end the school to prison pipeline. So our kids uh, are educated and not incarcerated. Our schools have figured out ways to train educators. We've gone, we've gone from schools where students didn't have access to computers. When this pandemic started, uh, we uncovered a very unfortunate uh, reality that there were a million students who didn't have access to a computer at home and didn't have access to high-speed internet. And so we launched a task force on closing the digital divide. We worked with you and others um, in the governor's office to, to make sure that there'd be donations. Uh, and we had to work with computer uh, manufacturers to make sure that California could get supply. Um, the state was giving billions to schools, but there was a time when school districts across the country couldn't get uh, any uh, laptops. And, and so um, we literally worked with uh, manufacturers to preserve supply uh, for California. Uh, and so that led to some tough moments, but now we are moving closer to connection. Our legislature has um, provided us with $6 billion for uh, expanding broadband uh, in the state. We even had an innovation challenge, and we're still working on this innovation challenge, where we're asking our researchers and our institutions of higher education to help us think through the best way to create internet access, because we want internet connectivity to flow like electricity in this state. And so we've got some work to do, um, but we certainly have laid the foundation for closing what has been a long time digital divide for low income kids and students of color that we are going to work to close that divide. And, uh, and so, you know, difficult moments, but from those moments, I think a spotlight on inequity uh, and, and really giving us the impetus to say, we'll build an education system that's better than what we had before uh, for all California students. That is, I, I really wanna go back to this issue on the digital divide, but you know, when I think about some of the fundamental divides that we face in our state, we know that um, one of the central issues facing educators and parents is how to help students catch up as we emerge from COVID. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about what the data say in terms of the learning loss that occurred during this crisis and the state's priorities around meeting that challenge. You know, if you think about a million students not having access to a computer, it doesn't surprise you that we would see the kind of learning loss and gaps that our students experience. Um, by some accounts, 50% um, of students in grades three through eight um, did not meet standards for English uh, language arts, um, and maybe two thirds of students in those grade spans uh, did not uh, meet standards for, for math. Uh, those uh, numbers become even more difficult when you look at, through the lens of the experience of, of Black and Latino students. And so um, we know that our students have struggled, and it may take years to really uh, work through some of that learning loss. And we believe that there are a number of programs that will help us, uh, not to mention with uh, billions that are being provided now for our school districts for you know, expanded learning time, right? That just means non-school time that can be used for tutoring, uh, mentoring, and other uh, support programs that we are, as we speak, implementing a universal preschool program for every single four-year-old in our state. That becomes critical because when you look at the younger grades, we know that there are lots of loss and impacts on our, on our youngest students. Uh, I mentioned the universal meals, and I'd like to just mention uh, a, a new effort that we are now embarking upon to ensure that our students learn to read by third grade. Um, there was a recent study put out by the New York Times that talked about the kind of uh, losses that students um, experience around literacy. And so we are hearkening back to something that's always been a goal 
for the education sector to make sure that students learn to read by third grade. Research and data tell us that when students learn to read by third grade, they're less likely to drop out, they're more likely to graduate. And we know that reading is a gateway skill. And so that when students acquire this skill, they can uh, you know, read to learn just about anything. And so we are sponsoring uh, a number of pieces of legislation that would help to accelerate our efforts around reading. We've got a, a family literacy home visiting program that helps to families to get access to books. We've got a Freedom School program, which is an Afrocentric literacy intervention that helps students improve their grade level reading by as many as two grades, sometimes in as little as six weeks. We have a dual language immersion bill because we know when students learn another language, it supports brain development. It prepares them to be global leaders in the world. Uh, and we've embarked on an effort to make sure that students have books in their hands. We're gonna provide a million books for students and families in need. We've even partnered with online uh, reading providers who've allowed California students to download books for free. In about a two month period, we saw students download about 5 million books in English and in Spanish and in French. And so we know that our families are hungry for reading. Um, we are working on a strategy with the governor and his proposed budget that would provide reading coaches and specialists to help new teachers learn how to teach reading. That's not something that everyone knows. And so we wanna provide all these strategies that we think will help um, students to recover. We think that the literacy component is a key one uh, to supporting the literary, uh, the, the learning recovery of California students. When you think about that learning recovery, are you supportive of proposals to extend the, the school year to address the, the learning loss that, it, that has occurred? Or how are you thinking about just when that recovery happens, where it happens, how it happens? Uh, you know, I think expanding the school year or the school day, these are all part of the resources and tools that will be available to school districts to offset learning loss and gaps. Um, school districts get to make decisions about their calendar. And so now they have the resources if they choose to have a longer school year or a longer school day, that they can use those resources to do that. School districts may opt to have more programs during the summer. Um, to help offset learning slide. This is something that school systems have done for years, have used summer as a time to offset learning slide uh, for our students. And so the options are there for districts that want to expand their school year and to lengthen it uh, as a strategy uh, for supporting learning. Um, so no matter what choice a district makes, uh, the state has made sure that the school districts will have the resources that they need to offset these learning gaps and support our students for the, the next several years to come. You know, I want to talk about resources a bit because um, for years there was a narrative that California underinvested in its students. And what we know is that this year, the proposal that um, for the amount of money on a per student funding basis for California students would be about $20,000 per student, which I think is up from about $16,000 in 2018, 19. Can you talk about the most critical investments that the state is making and where these dollars need to flow to be most effectively used? Yeah, I think it's true that for years, California has found itself somewhere between, you know, the high 30s and low 40s in per pupil spending. And there are research um, papers that have always talked about how California would need to spend more on a per pupil basis to really help our students reach their full potential. It's ironic that the funding levels have increased and they've come to us during the most difficult time that we'll probably experience during the pandemic. But nevertheless, we have seen going back to last year and this year, a record level of revenue coming to the state in the form of a surplus that allows us to fund the kinds of programs that we've been advocating for I think for decades. Again, universal uh, preschool for every single four-year-old. I think it's a game changer. We're excited to be implementing uh, that program. Uh, we look at these programs as a package and um, we see them as a way of helping to transform uh, California education, uh, universal preschool, universal meals, so that every hungry student uh, can get uh, you know, two meals a day, regardless of their income or their background. Uh, the community schools initiative, the $3 billion strategy to provide wraparound supports to support 
California students. There is a $4 billion strategy for building out a mental health strategy for young people from birth to age 25. And there are uh, billions of dollars available for providing professional development for our educators, for everything from uh, addressing implicit bias to educator effectiveness and how to support uh, new teachers and existing teachers and to provide them with mentors and coaches and access to master teachers who can support them. Uh, we're seeing record investments that we've never seen before. And to me, they spell the opportunity to build an education system better than what we've ever had before. One that can truly help us close um, gaps and equity gaps that have existed long before the pandemic. So, so, you know, the governor's budget actually calls for, I think, a billion dollars to be invested in universal transitional kindergarten. I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit more about that, because that sounds like a lot of money to everyday Californians. How many students will it serve? What role does CDE play in allocating those resources? Can you just talk a little bit about what that proposal is? And you, you've spoken to how it will help us, but I don't know that people really understand what that, what that means. I think it's exciting that every four-year-old in our state can have access to quality instruction at school and that that will be for free. Um, it, this is something that we've known for decades, that when children have access to preschool or early education of any kind, um, that it does prepare them for their future. It helps to close learning gaps. It helps to ensure that students learn to read by third grade. It's a, a great tool for school readiness so that when students enter kindergarten, they've already had preschool experiences. And it's a, to me, it, it is a game changer. It also means that our schools have to build out the systems to be able to implement this. And that means that we may need 10,000 new preschool teachers um, to help provide the, the deliverables of universal preschool. And so, you know, right now we are working with uh, educator groups and school district leadership um, to figure out how are we going to tackle these uh, gaps we have in, in uh, the availability of the workforce, um, to have more teachers, more bus drivers, people who provide the meals. And so um, the Universal Preschool is an incredible program, but without those educators who can um, help us to build it out, we won't be able to make the promise uh, of this incredible program. We wanna deliver on that promise. And so we'll be busy looking for strategies. We're gonna have to figure out more compensation uh, for our teachers. We're gonna have to figure out better training for educators. We have to figure out how to fill gaps. If you have staff who say, I'm not gonna take the job as a bus driver because I can make more money working in fast food or I can get more of a full-time opportunity, we've got to figure out how to help our schools um, really build out uh, our workforce and diversify our workforce. Um, and there are resources for this. We have $500 million in scholarships uh, available for someone who wants to become a teacher. We have scholarships for those who are working in classified staff who want to become a teacher. And we have residency programs where someone can, and can come into the profession, can work in a school while they're also getting their credential and be supported and coached and mentored by experienced teachers. And so we have the resources, we have to put it all together. Um, and when we do so, it will put us in a position to implement a great program like Universal Preschool. It seems like we have certainly the, the financial resources. I'm wondering, you know, as we think about the challenges of implementation, do we have enough programs? Do we have sufficient interest? Are we, are we, are we in a position where we have the right levels of pay and salary to attract the kinds of teachers that we would want teaching our four-year-olds. Um, and, and so I'm wondering about scaling that, that implementation, particularly because it's supposed to roll out over the next couple of years. Are all of those things in place or are those things, are, are those, is that infrastructure we still need to build? I would say that there's an infrastructure still that needs to be built. I would say that there is high degree of interest. I think what's key is timing. How do we roll these out in a way where schools are able to roll these programs in and not feel like resources are just being pushed down on them. And, uh, you know, right now schools are dealing with a lot. And so we do have to figure out how to phase these efforts in. I'll use universal meals as an example. 
Um, it's a great program and ambitious in its goal, and it's very needed. You know, as somebody who was a student who was on the free lunch program, I can't tell you how important these programs are. But in order for us to be able to provide these universal meals, our school districts need to be able to ramp up uh, their 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 school kitchens. And so there are dollars in the state budget for making those upgrades. But we're also seeing that there is a a, a run on products that the costs and services. The, the price has, has gone up because there are shortages in resources, food stuff and resources. Even at the grocery store, we all see it. The, the price for meats and other types of things have gone up because of limited availability during the pandemic. And schools are impacted by that. And so they need time to work through implementation for upgrading their facilities, for providing new training to staff so that we can get healthier food products uh, to our students. All of these incredible strategies need a ramp up period to build out the infrastructure, to staff up, to train the staff and to get them ready uh, for these important uh, initiatives. And we're at the beginning stages of these efforts and working with our districts on how they do that. And you're confident that we can get there, though. I am confident that we can get there because we're California and I think California dreams big and delivers big for California kids. Um, But we are in the midst of a pandemic still. And it is the toughest moment that we will experience in our lifetime. And, you know, if you think about it in context, in this country, more than 900,000 Americans have lost their lives. Um, You know, we all know someone who's uh, been deeply impacted by the coronavirus impact. We've seen a spike in hate uh, uh, throughout the pandemic. The killing of George Floyd, the spike in hate against our Asian American Pacific Islander community. We've seen uh, a push to say we shouldn't talk about the impacts of systemic racism in our schools, even though California has passed legislation that says we will require the teaching of ethnic studies as a graduation requirement. We see bullying of in other states of our transgender and LGBTQ plus students. My goodness, just yesterday, uh, the governor of Florida signed a bill that says, uh, don't say gay. Whereas in California, we are building programs to help our educators be able to provide some more support for our LGBTQ plus students. Honored to work with Equality California and others on how we build out those resources. Because we know when we support our LGBTQ plus students, we know that our students see academic growth and social growth. Later this week, we're having a conversation about how to create more safe bathrooms uh, for trans students and for everyone on our campuses. And so I believe that California is able to do things in a way that's different than other states, bigger and more thoughtful, but we also have to build out the infrastructure to to make these things happen. They cannot happen overnight. Um, It will take years to fully recover uh, from the experience of the pandemic. We've heard that from pediatricians and mental health experts, uh, but California's up for that challenge. And if we all shoulder the load together, I know that we can do more together for our 6 million students. So let me ask a question about those 6 million students because declining enrollment is a challenge for California's public schools right now. And some of those declines are projected to be several years out. Um, Are the investments that are being made in schools, will they help districts manage that change? And I'm curious to know what your views are in terms of this idea of shifting the funding formula from average daily attendance to something that's closer to an enrollment based model. Well, on the last point about that shift, uh, we are sponsoring the bill that would make that shift, SB 830. Um, And we agree that for far too long, uh, California schools have suffered as they've tried to deal with chronic absenteeism. And because revenue for schools is tied to attendance, um, we've seen that the schools that need the resources to address chronic absenteeism uh, go without those resources. And so um, we are glad to be uh, sponsors of SB 830 and to um, create a, a, a new way to fund California schools um, that recognizes that they not only need revenue, but they need revenue to support services to do outreach to students who have been chronically absent. And so uh, we're grateful to, um, to support that legislation. We hope that it makes it across the finish line. There's also legislation that we are sponsoring that would uh, increase uh, the funding in the local control funding formula, um, provide a greater cost of living adjustment um, to help schools 
keep pace with the rising costs of education and recognizing that um, schools have in fact experienced sharp decline. The decline was starting before the pandemic and schools have been struggling to deal with it. It has become exacerbated during the pandemic. And we know that um, families have left the state. Uh, we have to think about declining enrollment if we're going to help our schools build the infrastructure to continue supporting our students. And, and so um, we are uh, working hard to pass new uh, legislation that we think will get important revenue and resources to our schools to do that. Does the enrollment based model shift um, how we think about accountability for our schools? I mean, you know, the part of the idea, I guess, of, of ADA is that students, we know that those students, you know, those schools are being paid because students are showing up. How do we know now about an enrollment based model that monies that are allocated are actually going to actually support the students. You know, I think about the accountability model all the time. I spent probably the better part of the last 10 to 15 years really trying to <clears throat> offset chronic absenteeism, you know, knocking on doors, doing outreach to families to find out where students are. Even during the pandemic, we joined with school districts like Oakland Unified and Inglewood Unified, where we literally got on the phone to call families who did not show up for school during the pandemic to find out you know, why. And, and often they're experiencing challenges. One of the things I've noticed though is that schools haven't always had the resources to do that kind of outreach, to go knocking on doors, to go visit families. And so you know, a bill like SB 830 actually does envision accountability because it says 50% of those new revenues have to be used for attendance outreach measures. And so this is not something saying that, you know, you can just stop having accountability. Um, it's just saying that schools that have had greater mm -hmm. issues around chronic absenteeism have by default and de facto been punished by not, they, they lose the revenue that they need to help families and they don't get the supports that they need. Uh, SBA 30 actually says, let's change the equation. Um, California is one of only a handful of states that still provides revenue based on attendance patterns. Um, you know, California should lead here, not follow. And this is a, a thoughtful a piece of legislation that um, would, actually, um, would actually create the resources needed to address chronic absenteeism. Great. You know, I'd love to talk for a minute about teachers because there's a conundrum happening right now, <clears throat> excuse me, um, with teachers. And I'm wondering if you could help explain it to the audience because on the one hand, we have higher than usual retirements and resignations causing a teacher shortage. And on the other, we're hearing stories of some school districts that are actually issuing pink slips. And I'm wondering, um, how do we have both a teacher shortage and we're considering layoffs? And if you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and, and, and you know, SBA 30 um, by Senator Portentino is, is really something that we think would help to address some of these challenges. If you look at a school district like Oakland Unified, which recently had to make a hard decision to close almost a dozen schools, um, SBA 30 would provide $24 million more into the general fund to support the overall operation for that school district. And so what we're seeing is at, even at a time when there's a high level of investment of state and federal dollars, at our schools, much of that money is one-time money. And it is not uh, enough to pay teachers and staff to continue working long-term. That means that if you really look at where things are, we've had districts even before the pandemic that were struggling to pay their bills. We have uh, you know, at least a dozen districts that are at risk for running out of money, again, because of declining enrollment, the rising cost of education, you know, the, the, the cost of living adjustment coming to schools, not keeping pace with the rising cost of education. Um, school districts are struggling. And it does, it, it, it is hard to imagine at a time when we need to recruit and retain more staff that school districts are forced to lay off staff because they simply cannot meet their budget. They're, they have more expenses than they have revenue. And so that's why we're supporting these measures like SB 830. That's why we're supporting um, the bill that would provide more resources for the cost of living adjustment in the local control funding formula by Assemblymember Al Murisucci. We know that these resources are critical uh, to our schools and their ability to continue to operate. Um, until we have a, a, a more balanced uh, uh, way of financing public education, we're gonna need these measures. What most folks real, don't realize is that California's revenue stream is so cyclical. 
And when our economy is down, we get less money from property tax and income tax and sales tax. And that means our overall state budget is being cut. And that means school budgets are being cut. And so we need to create more permanent funding solutions, long-term solutions that will help our families. I am grateful to our governor, our legislature, and to the federal government that have given us all of these dollars to support during the pandemic. But because they're one time, um, you know, you cannot build out your budgets for staffing over the next course of the several years uh, with just one time dollars. And so we've got to build out a permanent funding stream to support California schools. So do you think that that $20,000 in per pupil spending, we should not expect to see that next year? Or is there enough in the system now with the declining enrollment that we think that those numbers will stay fairly even over time? How should we be thinking about that? Well, you know, the all the financial experts are predicting that there could be a financial cliff around the corner. And so many of the investments that have been made that are just tremendous, they're, they're one-time dollars that can be spread out over the next several years. But in terms of overall financial support for our system, um, you know, we continue to be vulnerable to a kind of, a, you know, peaks and valleys in how funding comes to our state for every single program. And so I believe that we need to identify a more permanent way to fund schools, to fund health care, to fund services for seniors um, in California. Uh, for now, we're seeing record investments for schools. But in order to sustain that, we know that we're going to need systemic changes in how we fund schools. Uh, going forward. Great. We are going to transition to audience Q&A shortly. As a reminder to our listeners and our watchers, please submit your questions to ppiceventquestions at gmail.com. Uh, a couple more questions for me before we, we make that transition. Sacramento Unified is currently on strike, and I understand that Mount Diablo has voted to authorize a strike after more than 250 days without a contract. Those who watch K-12 policy might remember that you began your term as SPI with strikes in Los Angeles and in Oakland, among others. Can you talk about how today's strikes compare to what we saw three years ago? How are they different? What's happening in the system when it comes to that? You know, we're seeing strikes um, being called across the nation. And, um, and it's very difficult. Um, and you mentioned it that um, we did a lot of work behind the scenes when Oakland was on strike uh, uh, in 2019 and the same for Los Angeles Unified. And in the case of Oakland Unified, I myself personally mediated 30 hours of time between um, the teachers group and the administration group to help them work through that. As it relates to Sac City, we did put out a call to convene all of the parties to come together because there were there was a period of time when the parties weren't meeting and that they, it reached a, a breakdown. And if, if, if groups aren't talking and meeting, you cannot resolve the strike. And from my standpoint right now, we must do everything that we can to resolve that strike because students need to be in class. They need to have the support of their teachers and being in school. And so top priority. And so we've been working with the parties behind the scenes as well to try and find ways to, to, to get to uh, resolving the strike. Now you mentioned Mount Diablo, uh, Mount Diablo and um, the Petaluma, Rona Park School District. They, they both were able to resolve their strikes using their fact finding recommendations. These are the neutral recommendations that get made when a stalemate is reached between both sides. Now Sac City, also has a fact-finding report that has those same neutrally generated uh, recommendations. We believe that's the pathway for resolving this strike. And we'll continue to work with uh, the parties to do everything that we can to help them get this strike resolved as soon as possible, get our kids back in class. Uh, we're gonna turn to those questions, as I said, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention that it's SPI, you have a seat on the UC Regents on the CSU trustees, and also on the Governor's Council for Post-Secondary Education. Can you talk about what these posts have allowed you to do on behalf of K-12 students, um, particularly as the pandemic is concerned? Well, it was an honor to work with you and others on an initiative to help create, you know, when we talk about creating career pathways, you know, that's more than just recruiting people into a job, right? We've got to make sure that what students our learning in middle school and high school aligns for what they're gonna do going forward. And so I've been honored to work through the Council on Higher Education um, to make sure that there is an alignment um, with what students are learning 
in career technical education that aligns with pathways like accountants and nurses to make sure that regions in our state that haven't had um, these positions in agribusiness, all these important trend set, set, settings and uh, where, sectors where we need to have more positions. It's been an honor to really work on how we build that alignment and to work with the governor who's literally sent resources to regions in the state to prepare for the jobs of tomorrow. I've been honored to both in my role, uh, in my role as a, as a region and as a trustee um, to uh, support uh, finding a better way to prepare our students for higher education rather than just high stakes testing like the, SA, the SAT. Uh, I've been honored to work both in the role of superintendent and previously in the legislature uh, to support um, creating a free college in the state of California in two years of community college for free and that we can create the pathway. We have an incredible system of community colleges in our state that uh, prepare our students for the UC, the CSU and, and for our private institutions. We have great institutions in California and it's been great to work with them. Um, unfortunately, much of the time of my tenure has been during the pandemic. And so our questions have been focused on safety and survival and how do we make sure students can, can continue to learn and thrive uh, but we've had robust conversations about how our institutions of higher education, they are critical in the pipeline of preparing uh, for, uh, for teachers and, 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 and staff who will support our schools. And so it's been an honor to serve on that council. Uh, we, we know that there's more that we need to do um, as it relates to addressing food insecurity and homelessness of our students in higher education. California provides more money through various programs to support our students. And we've worked hard to make sure that our students are claiming every single dollar to help them. And our state legislature has provided robust budgets to support our UC and our CSUs, but we, we've got to create more seats. We don't have enough seats in higher education. We've got to create partnerships that mean more people can attend the UC, the CSU. And a big part of that is working with our private institutions of higher education um, to create more spaces uh, to support our students. And I just think job number one has got to be addressing the homelessness and the food insecurity that many of our students, there's no reason why we should allow our students to sleep in a car while they're attending an institution of higher education. We've got to make um, making uh, ways to address these programs a top priority. Thank you. Um, so here's one question from our audience. It's from a mother of three in the Alvord Unified Schools District in Riverside. She writes, uh, what needs to be done so that the US Department of Education reforms the school curriculum? I'm concerned that federal guidance puts too much emphasis on homework and overly long testing at the risk of making kids lose interest in school and even drop out. Thoughts? You know, I, I share, I, I wanna thank the parent uh, for those thoughts and concerns. You know, we think that learning is more than just high stakes taste testing. That's why um, I supported the, the move in both the UC and the CSU to, to say we're gonna pause the focus on the SAT, look at the full portfolio of student accomplishment and what students are learning. Um, you know, we do have to have some ways to measure learning. And so we do have statewide tests uh, that allow you to compare what a third grader in California knows to what a third grader knows in another state. And we do have those efforts, but uh, our, our students are more than a test score. And we've got to be able to continue to invest in them um, to make sure that we address their social emotional learning needs. Our State Board of Education has been very thoughtful in trying to create a broadened um, uh, way of thinking about what goes into the California curriculum. That includes everything from health education for our students in middle school and high school. That means ethnic studies and a graduation requirement for our high school students, where our students have the chance to see the contributions of their ancestors. And what we found is that with ethnic studies is that students of color graduate in higher rates and perform academically at a higher rate. Matter of fact, we see students from all backgrounds do better when we have uh, ethnic studies available to our students. And so um, we, California has been creative in, in really enhancing the curriculum of what our students can learn. I'm hopeful that we're gonna see more dual language immersion programs uh, through the bill that we're sponsoring uh, right now with Senator Lamone that would um, provide schools with the ability to become dual language immersion schools because we think that learning a language provides brain development and it helps to support students of the world. By the way, we also wanna see our students get access to civics 
and to learn how to be involved in their community. We want them to have access to environmental education, hands-on education, and of course, career technical education. Right now, we are sponsoring a bill that would provide paid internships to, uh, to students who are in our career technical education programs. So our students can learn and earn at the same time. They may be able to support themselves and their family, and they're gonna get on a pathway to learn about important careers that prepare them for the jobs of tomorrow. So, um, you know, we're trying to be thoughtful about it and. Uh, we appreciate your concern about making sure our students are, are more than uh, just a test score. We have an audience question from Leanne Melendez at ABC News 7, and she would like to know, when do you expect mask mandates um, that some of the state school, school districts still have in place will be lifted? Well, of course, as you all know, the State Department of Public Health has lifted the mask mandate um, for California schools. And so in any case where their students are wearing masks, that is the choice of the school district board or the choice of individual students. But there is no longer a mandate for wearing a mask uh, in California schools. Now there is a recommendation that schools still continue to utilize masks, but this is totally voluntary. California has done enough work that we've seen a drop and decline in COVID cases that we can be at the place where fewer masks are required uh, and where there are fewer cases. But we also see data that shows that we need to continue to be vigilant, in particular in communities like the African-American community and the Asian-American Pacific Islander community, we still see high rates of COVID infection. And so we know that we have a lot of work to do, whether it be more vaccine outreach and creating opportunities to keep us all safe. Because what we don't want is anything to be a threat to our ability to keep our schools open. I want California to stay open, schools open, businesses open, our communities open. And that means that we continue to take the mitigations that we need to until COVID goes away. And so uh, for now, there is no mask mandate uh, but schools still have the option if, if districts choose to, um, to require students to wear a mask. And do you have a sense of when some of those local districts that have made that choice, is that gonna be for the rest of the school year or are they kind of actively monitoring the situation so that uh, eventually those mask mandates might be lifted? It's as you said, school districts are monitoring and um, you know some districts have set a date and, and and they're monitoring towards the date there's no uniformity districts are making decisions according to their communities uh, districts that have concerns about higher rates of infection may take more time um, you know right now what we're encouraging districts to do is to make sure that they're utilizing rapid COVID testing when students are are going to be on spring break so that we can avoid any kind of spikes or surge. And so when students come back to school, schools can stay open. And so, um, you know, we do encourage folks to continue to do those things that will keep us all safe so we can keep our schools open, keep our communities open. Right. Joseph Campbell with Montessori Services would like to know, how can we ensure low-income black and brown students receive an equal education in California? Thank you for the question. You know, we've been working and are still working on ways to address this learning gap, this opportunity gap. That, and part of what we have to do is diversify our workforce. And uh, the last several years, I have sponsored legislation that would help to create um, diversification of the workforce, including male educators of color. Research shows that when there's simply even just one Black teacher at a school, that students of color do better, that all students do better from all backgrounds. And so as we speak, we are working to implement a residency program that will provide uh, anyone uh, who wants to become a teacher the chance to do that. We try to direct those students, uh, teachers, future teachers to areas of high need like special education, STEM education, math, and, and other places. And so um, the way that we will close those learning gaps for students of color is by diversifying our workforce, providing more training for our workforce. And, and that's why right now we are administering a $10 million grant in anti-bias education. We've been working on an education and hate initiative. We have a multi-billion dollar educator effectiveness grant that helps new teachers become stronger teachers, that gives teachers a chance to be coached by other teachers. It will take all of these resources to help close these learning gaps, all that, and programs to help counter 
chronic absenteeism, and to make sure that students learn to read by third grade. And that's why you hear me coming back to these initiatives that we are, 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 are leading to ensure that our students learn to read. When students learn to read, they're less likely to be uh, in a, the position of dropping out. And we can narrow and close the, the achievement gap, the opportunity gap, by using these strong literacy programs, by using dual language immersion programs, by using teacher training and effectiveness programs and diversifying our workforce. We have to end suspensions in our schools. We see disproportionality in suspensions in our schools. And we see mostly kids of color being suspended. When kids are being, <coughs> being pushed out and when they're being pushed out, makes it harder for them to learn and it spikes the achievement gap. And so we'll continue to work on these efforts that we are leading as we speak uh, in every step of the way. And we're working with our thousand districts to get this done. Great. A viewer from Berkeley would like to hear the superintendent's thoughts on the elimination of standardized tests, both the ACT and the SAT for California uh, admissions at UC and CSU. And especially what that means for A through G completion and the availability of A through G courses and of course the qualified teachers to teach those courses. Well, we have to make sure that all of our students have access to the A to G requirements and there, and that is a place where we still have work to do as a system. Uh, and we are working with our districts on, on ways to, to improve there. Uh, I for one have supported moving away uh, from the SAT uh, as a way of, of gaining entry into uh, higher education. We know that our students can perform in higher education. They need the opportunity. And research has shown that at times the SAT has been a barrier and that there's been racial disparities uh, as it relates to the administration of the SAT. Uh, data shows us that a better predictor of success in higher education is GPA. Um, we look at the portfolios that students uh, 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 perform and student work. And so we believe that this creates a better pathway uh, for supporting our students for higher education. And we'll continue to work with our school districts uh, on how we prepare our students for higher education. Great. Um, you know, one question we have from the audience is that, you know, California is about to emerge from the pandemic, but there remains a very real threat of new variants. What plans does CDE have in the event that we have another surge? Are, uh, will there be more mask mandates? Will we move back to remote learning? Are there other strategies that you see the state taking up if we have a new surge? Well, ultimately the California Department of Public Health outlines what we must do from a health standpoint, even in our schools. And so the Department of Public Health is working on a vaccine mandate that would be implemented likely um, by the summer. But in the meantime, there is legislation being pursued now that would create a vaccine mandate. Uh, the author of the bill, I, I think they recognize that there is the threat for, for new variants. And so um, as we speak, we're in a period where masks are not required, uh, but we know that that could easily be uh, reversed if we see a spike in any of these new variants that they're talking about. Uh, we know that healthcare experts are talking about the possibility of additional boosters. And we know that right now there is a low um, uptake rate in the vaccines uh, for those who are in the age of five through 11. And so we recognize that we have to stay vigilant. It's great that we're in an environment where we don't, aren't required to wear masks in public, um, but I think now more than ever, we have to continue our efforts around vaccine outreach uh, and helping those who can to get a booster uh, so that we can keep our schools open and protect against any new variant that might threaten to close our schools. Our final audience question. When you think about your time as SPI, what do you wanna be able to say about how you impacted California's school system over the long term? You know, I'd like to walk away from this having said that we have prepared our students for the jobs of tomorrow. And that's why I've named our task force on literacy with a requirement that students learn to read by 2026. This is a goal that has evaded our system for far too long. And I believe that it is something that we can and that we must do. Um, and that when students learn to read, they can read to learn anything. And so I've given myself a homework assignment to work on for the next four years to make sure that our students learn to read. We must move past this barrier that has existed in education in this nation for decades. And I believe that we can do that. Equity is our top priority. 
closing the opportunity gap, closing the digital divide. I'm proud of the work that we've done to now have $6 billion to lay the fiber, to lay the infrastructure for broadband for students all across the state. Uh, I'd like to see that our legislation on recruiting and retaining 10,000 additional mental health clinicians is successful, that we build up that workforce and that we have a call to action for those who wanna become a teacher or a classified staff member to work in our school. This is a noble profession, uh, but our educators have experienced fatigue and difficult experiences along with our families. And we've got to do all that we can to provide them so that we have access to the workforce that will prepare our students for the jobs of tomorrow. I'm committed to these things and hope to be working on these uh, for the next four years. If the voters uh, give me the opportunity uh, to return uh, in this election year, um, but I can see no more important work than uh, getting the 10,000 mental health clinicians in place and making sure that all of our students learn to read by third grade by the year 2026. Thank you. My Thank final you. question for you, you know, the past couple of years have been so challenging for our schools, for our state, for our nation. And as you look to the future, what gives you the most hope? You know, I believe that we are more than our circumstances and it's been difficult. And I believe that we can work through this trauma, perhaps because of my own experience. When I was six years old, I lost my only parent, my mom, to cancer. My dad was a Vietnam vet who never came home from the war. I found my father and met him for the first time uh, after looking on the internet. And so my family struggled. You know, I was raised by a cousin who was also an immigrant, like my mom from Panama. Um, we struggled. I was on the free lunch program. I received public assistance. We received government cheese in my household. You know, we needed public programs to help us overcome poverty. Education is the most important public program I've ever had a chance to participate in. And it has been a game changer and has allowed me to overcome my own humble beginnings. And it is why I made the decision to become state superintendent so that we can provide those same sorts of opportunities for California students. As hard as it is, I still have hope that we can move past the challenges that we face and provide those same sorts of opportunities for every one of our 6 million students in this state. I'm honored to serve as a state superintendent. And I know that when we shoulder the load together, we can do more together for each of our 6 million students. We have reached the end of our program. I am so enormously grateful to you, Superintendent Thurman, for your time today, for joining me, as I said earlier, for your public service and just wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you on behalf of all Californians for the work that you do. And uh, just wanted to say thank you also for joining us. I know you were just with the Sec Secretary Cardona touring a school and you made time for Californians and that is part and parcel of what it means to be a fine public servant. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that. Thank you, it's my honor to serve. Whatever it takes to get this job done, we will do because our kids are worth it. So thank you for helping to, to get the word out about the things taking place in our state as it relates to education. Thank you, Dr. Jose. have a great day. Thank you, Superintendent. I would also like to thank our sponsors and of course, finally, thanks to all of you for joining us today online. I hope you'll join us again tomorrow in our final event of this mini series uh, on lessons on the pandemic, because I'll be talking with Michael Tubbs, the founder of End Poverty in California and the former mayor of Stockton. Finally, if you pre-register for today's event, later today you'll receive a survey and we hope you'll take a couple of minutes to fill it out and let us know how you think we did. Thank you once again for joining us. Be safe, have a good afternoon and I'll see you tomorrow.